Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my talk. In the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss how we do applied ML at scale to provide a world-class data-driven guidance to impact our day-to-day -day operations. I'm Sumit Trahan. I lead and manage the engineering team behind this product. So what is this product in a nutshell? This product sifts through text-heavy unstructured data and aims to answer three fundamental questions for us. What happened, why it happened, and when it happened. And by the phrase it, I'm alluding to an event such as an equipment fail during operations. So we want to understand what component of an equipment failed. What was the underlying reason why it failed? And last, what is the frequency of such a failure? Here's my engineering team, which comprises of applied ML scientists and ML engineers. Here's the agenda for our talk. I'll first talk about the business driver and then go into the technical details of how our system looks at model development, how our system looks during runtime, what is the architecture of our system. And then also spend a few minutes to talk about data science, the NLP algorithm that we use under the hood to answer the three questions. What happened, when it happened, and why it happened. So let's spend a few minutes to talk about the business driver. At ExxonMobil, we operate a wide area of equipment across the globe. For example, on the left is a floating vessel that we operate in Latin America. And on the right, we have complex machinery that we operate in Asia. For every piece of equipment that you observe here, for example, the antenna on the floating vessel or the helipad, we maintain a detailed service or a maintenance log. So the business driver for our product is, can we sift through the text heavy maintenance and the service log and answer the question, what happened, when it happened, and why it happened? And by the phrase it, I'm alluding to an event such as failure of an equipment or an equipment component. By answering those three fundamental questions, we can then put together a story that can help our end user drive insights toward what's an outlier? Does a specific piece of equipment fail faster than others? It can help our end user with capacity planning. It can help our end user with prioritization of maintenance tasks. So using these insights, we are, we are able to impact the bottom line of our company. And it is projected that this product can help the corporation save millions of dollars on an annual basis. Now, before I talk about the architecture of the product, let me take a minute to talk about the challenges that we faced as we were developing this product. I classified those challenges into three broad categories. First is the infrastructure. We have legacy systems and infrastructure, which is where we store our data. So as we were developing the architecture for our product, we had to be cognizant of that fact that our data sits in our legacy system. Second, as we were scaling up the, our prototype, and we were thinking about putting our machine learning models into production, we had to carefully think through how we can scale our models, how we can we scale our machine learning algorithms to operate at ExxonMobil scale. Third is a data quality, which feeds directly into the complexity of our NLP algorithms. When we were doing exploratory data analysis or EDA, we observed a big variability in our input data. For example, a service log for a given equipment was expressed very differently by two engineers. In other words, for our same equipment, for same kind of servicing, it was expressed in our service logs very differently, which means when we design our NLP algorithms, we had to do something so that that is taken into account. Next, let's talk about the solution. At a higher level, we adjust our data from our legacy system into a cloud data warehouse. Once the data has landed in our data warehouse, we then do model serving and model training using Azure Databricks. And here is the architecture diagram. 
Now, for the purpose of this slide, I'm going to focus on the batch data. So our batch data, which sits in our legacy system, is first ingested into our cloud data warehouse, which is Snowflake. That's in the second column under storage. Now, once the data has landed in Snowflake, then we shift into model training or model serving mode. For example, during model training, you'll first read the data from Snowflake using SQL, or if it's a supervised learning, we load the data, which is labeled data from Azure Blob Storage. We spin up a Spark cluster, we train our model. Let's say it's a deep learning model. We spin up a GPU cluster. We train our machine learning model. And then we use MLflow for model registry. So in the next slide, as we talk about model development, what you will observe is that we use MLflow to compare different models or do the experimentation. Now, when it comes to model serving in, in the inference phase, we load the model using the REST endpoint that we have and then do an inference. And we write our findings or the output back to Snowflake, which is shown on the very right of the slide deck. Now, when we talk about output, we are alluding to answers to those three questions that we posed earlier. What happened, when it happened, and why it happened. So we use NLP algorithm to help us answer those questions. Next, let's dive a little bit deeper into the architecture and see how our system looks like when it comes to model development or ML pipeline development or at runtime. So here's how the system looks like at model development phase. When applied ML scientist wants to experiment or develop a new model, they use the Azure Databricks workspace. Now within this workspace, we use a Jupyter Notebook to help us experiment with different models. Now to develop a model or experiment with different models, the first thing we do is we load the data, let's say from Snowflake, if it's unsupervised learning. Now in the context of a supervised learning, we'll load the labeled data, which sits in Azure Blob Storage. Once we have the data, the, raw, the, the relevant input data, then we also pull the common utils. Now what we've done in this product is bundled all the different modules, the common utility into a Python package. So we load this common util package along with our label data and then spin up a Spark cluster to do our model training. Now the Spark cluster might be a simple commodity machine, let's say with 14 gig RAM or 20 machines. Now, once we have done the training, or we are in the process of experimenting with different models, we leverage MLflow to help with model versioning, to help us com compare different models, to see which model is the best, and then save the model that we want to use for production. Common utils. Now, before I move on to the next slide, let me take a minute to talk about those common utils. We bundled all our common utils in a Python package. And what we observed is that it helps us enforce a schema, it helps us introduce standardization. It helped avoid boilerplate copy paste for, for an applied ML scientist. It also abstracts away the IO of data, let's say our data models and other assets used by type or location or format. It abstracts away all those pain points from us, from an applied ML scientist perspective. And last, during the model development phase, this common util package, it can be configured with a file, allowing us to swap in a local backend during the initial development or unit testing phase. Next, let's talk about how our system looks from an ML pipeline development phase. We break down our product into a number of small independent units of work or building blocks. We call these building blocks as steps. So we can run these building blocks or steps in parallel, or we can run them in series, or we can run them independently, depending on what output do we desire. We then use ADO pipeline to help us build these building blocks or steps. So ADO pipeline helps us build and copy the binary distribution into the Azure Databricks file system or DBFS. Now in the next slide, we will see how we use this in the runtime. 
during the runtime, all the individual steps or building blocks are now wrapped in ADF or Azure Data Factory activity and composed into nodes in a DAG, which we trigger daily. Activity nodes or the building blocks are Databricks jobs that are sent to a cluster. In our case, it's 20 commodity machines with 14 gig RAM. So at runtime, each job will pull data from various resources. For example, in this slide, if we focus on step two, that's building block two, then it pulls the relevant input data from the ingestion zone of Snowflake, which is in the third column from the very right. It pulls in the relevant data from the ingestion zone of Snowflake. It might also pull in the necessary labeled data from Azure Blob Storage. And then it will spin up a Spark cluster to train a machine learning model and then use that model to make a prediction. Or if in case of an inference time, it will just load that model using the REST endpoint and make the prediction and write the prediction back to the enrichment zone of the Snowflake. So if we have N different steps or N different building blocks, then each building block or each step or each node as we run creates its own table in the enrichment zone of Snowflake. At the end, when we wanna feed this data into the dashboard so that our end customer can look at the final results, we do a SQL join of all the tables that we have populated in the enrichment zone of Snowflake and then feed that re resulting table into our dashboard, which powers up the insights that our engineers or the folks or the boots on the ground use to make their decisions on a daily basis. Next, let's switch gears and talk more about the data science. How does our NLP workflow look like, which helps us answer the questions, what, when, and why? So let's take a look at our NLP workflow. Here's an example of our workflow at a 50,000 feet view. We ingest the raw data from Snowflake. That's a cloud data warehouse, as we saw in our architecture slides. Then we do the cleanup using regular expressions. We do tokenization and feed those tokens into a fast text model. And once we have the embeddings from a fast text model, we take those embeddings, feed those into a classifier, which helps us understand and answer the question, what, when, and why? Now, if you look at the first sample on the very left, which says the XYZ pump has failed, I've anonymized it by the way, from that sentence, we can clearly see that if we are talking about a pump, so the expected output in this case should be the XYZ pump is a component or is the equipment that has failed. And in the next slide and the slide after that, we'll talk a little bit more into how we actually do this. This is how our workflow looks like during the training and the inference stage. For simplicity, let's start with an inference stage. During inference, we load our relevant input data and go directly to step two. In step two, we load the fast text model and then we generate embeddings. Now, of course, I assume that we have done the cleanup and tokenization before we load it, before we ran it through our fast text model. So once we have the embeddings in step two, we then directly jump to step four, where we load our classifier, our supervised machine learning model to help us understand what failed given the input data. Now, depending on the prediction quality, if we have enough confidence, then from step five, we can directly go to step six where we write that prediction back to Snowflake. However, if we do not have enough confidence in our prediction, then we directly go from step five to step seven where we use an unsupervised linguistic model to help us answer the question, what failed? Now, this is how our workflow looks like during the inference phase. Let's see how the workflow looks like during the training phase. So in the training phase, we first go to step one where we load the training, the labeled data, which sits in Azure Blob Storage, by the way, into the memory. So once we have the labeled data, we clean up, we do tokenization, we go to directly to step two, 
where we have the FASTX model generate the embeddings. From embeddings, we go to step three. In step three, as we saw in the model development perspective, how our system looks like, they're gonna spin up a Spark cluster, train a model, register the model using MLflow, and then leverage that model during the inference period. So this is how our workflow looks like during the training or the inference phase. The key takeaway is we use a hybrid model, a supervised or an unsupervised model for our inference. And as I mentioned before, if we do not have enough confidence in our predictions, then we use an unsupervised model. So our unsupervised linguistic model pretends to act like a human. So when it looks like a, a raw input data, for example, the one shown here, which says the TX on the P1234 has failed. Then it starts to look at this data and says, aha, I have seen something similar in the past and I know TX is a shorthand for transmitter. At the same time, I've seen the pattern that P hyphen is a shorthand for a pump. Next, our linguistic model looks at the sentence and says, where's my noun, verbs, prepositions, adjectives? So once it has done all that, it is able to predict with reasonable confidence what failed based on this raw input data. So for example, here, our linguistic model tells us that the transmitter on that pump has actually failed, along with the motor, because it's a noun. So given the input text, our predictions will be pump transmitter and a motor. Again, the key thing I wanted to highlight here is that we have both a supervised and an unsupervised model. And the idea is that over time, as our supervised model tends to become better and better, a lot of our sample predictions will actually come from supervised model. Now, during an inference phase, if we observe that a lot of our predictions are done by unsupervised model, then at some point in an offline stage, we go back to this entire population where the inference was done using unsupervised model. We randomly pick some samples from this population where the inference was again done by unsupervised model, take those samples, have a human look at it, do the labeling, and then use that labeled data to help us improve our supervised model again. So we have this kind of a loop which we operate along with an unsupervised model. To summarize, at ExxonMobil, we operate a wide array of equipment. And for each equipment, we maintain a service log which is recorded as text in our legacy system. So in this product, we were able to come up with an architecture that can ingest the data from our legacy system use Databricks workspace to develop prototype and develop machine learning algorithms, and then scale those algorithms to ExxonMobil operation scale. We also leverage MLflow to help us with experimentation and development of different models and compare different models. This product provides us insights that can help us with outlier identification, capacity planning and prioritization of maintenance tasks. So with this product, what we have observed is a clear line of sight from how we leverage our maintenance or service logs, how we use those logs to answer those three fundamental questions. What happened, when it happened and why it happened. And by using the answer to those three questions using NLP, we were able to extract insights and those insights impact the decisions that we take on a day-to-day -day basis. And those decisions are projected to have an impact on our bottom line in the amount of millions of dollars on an annual basis. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take questions.